Hey guys, this is Melissa with Love Covered Life, and today I want to talk to you about the age-old question, how could a good and loving God allow evil to exist in the world? So if you haven't subscribed to my channel, don't forget to subscribe, and also don't forget to talk to me in the comments. I love hearing from you guys, whether it's related to my video or not, whether you agree or disagree, I just love hearing from you. I love the conversation. This video was inspired by one of my comments, actually. Um, Jan, and I'm going to read this comment to you here, Jan and Peter Schuring, I hope I pronounced your name right, I'm sorry if I'm not. Um, and this was six months ago, so I, yeah, I'm super sorry guys. I'm, I'm trying to get caught up on questions. Once you see the love, you can't unsee it. Every person who has made this step is forever closer to that beautiful truth. So glad you shared. Okay, so this is on one of my universalism videos. I see a lot of your reasoning of the sovereignty versus God's desire to redeem all dilemma as such a powerful way to, way to break through to the truth. As long as there is an eternal conscious torment hell as a possible outcome, then both Calvinism and Arminianism fail in giving God both attributes. Only universalism gives God his full sovereign power and most loving character. So I just read that all out because yes, yes, I couldn't have put it better than that. I'm curious to know your thoughts on the theodicy dilemma in lieu of his sovereignty. Why so much suffering? Does he restrain himself? These are questions I still struggle with. Like you said, God's love will win in the end, and yes, he does co-suffer with us, but I can't quite wrap my head around the degree of suffering if he is indeed all-powerful. At first, I just want to say, I don't have all the answers. People have been wrestling with this question for thousands of years, and so what I want to do is just add a voice to the conversation of what's already been being talked about. So first of all, theodicy means vindication of God. So when we talk about theodicy, we're, we're talking about how could an all-powerful, all-loving, all-wise God allow, or why would he even need to allow suffering in the world? So what I want to do is go to the Bible first and um, start by just briefly looking at a few passages that I feel address this question. And then I'm also going to share with you my experience and some other people's stories that I feel really add some insight to this question. So I think that a biblical answer would be that the sufferings and the evils of the world are allowed to happen for our own growth. So we can look at 1 James 1, 2 through 4, which says, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. So here we see that endurance is something that has to develop and grow. Um, and when it's fully developed, you will be perfect. You will need nothing. You will be complete. And somehow the trials and sufferings that come into the world allow that process to happen. Um, let's jump over to Romans 5, 3-5. It says, We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help us develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character, and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment. For we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. So endurance has been mentioned in both texts now as some type of a process that leads somewhere. Um, the first text said it leads to perfection, being perfect and complete, lacking in nothing or needing nothing. And here we see that endurance is the first step that leads to the ultimate development of knowledge of God's love in our heart. 1 Peter 4.12 Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you are going through as if something strange were happening to you. Instead, be very glad for these trials make you partners with Christ in his suffering. So here we see the purpose of trials is to make us partners with Christ, specifically in his suffering. And so what is Christ's suffering? He willingly sacrificed himself for the world. 
So when we go through trials, we are becoming partners with Christ in this self-sacrificial love. 1 Peter 1, 6-9 So be truly glad. There is wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold, though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. You love him even though you have never seen him. Though you do not see him now, you trust him and you rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy. The reward for trusting him will be the salvation of your souls. This passage in 1 Peter 1 reiterates the reason why we are here on earth. To learn to love God even though we cannot see him. And we'll get into that a little bit more later. We trust him or tune in to God through our inner awareness in our heart. This is what the Bible calls faith. And this is what is being said here is developed through our trials, our faith, our ability to tune in and connect with God in our hearts to find him that inner satisfaction in our hearts in this world even when it appears that he is not here even when we cannot see him this is so this is why we experience trials and sufferings in this life to grow our faith which is the love of God in our heart let's look at a few more texts that talk about the primacy of love in our earthly lives Galatians 5 6 what is most important is faith expressing itself in love. Galatians 5.13 For you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters, but don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. Colossians 3.14 Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. 2 Thessalonians 1.3 Dear brothers and sisters, we can't help but thank God for you because your faith is flourishing and your love for one another is growing. 1 Timothy 1.5 The purpose of my instruction is that all believers would be filled with love that comes from a pure heart, a clear conscience, and genuine faith. The purpose of his instruction is that all of us would be filled with love. 1 Peter 4 8. Most important of all, continue to show deep love for each other, for love covers a multitude of sins. And 1 John 3 11, This is the message you have heard from the beginning. We should love one another. So these are just a few passages, and I know somebody will come and criticize me for picking them out of context and just listing them there, but um, my point is just to show that the message of the Bible is love. It comes up over and over and over again. The purpose of their instruction, the apostles' instruction, is to teach us how to love. The message we've heard from the beginning is to love one another. Most important of all, continue to show love for one another. It's over and over and over. So the reason we are here is to love one another, to grow in our knowledge and understanding of the love of God in our heart, to become um, centered and satisfied in that love so that we are complete and perfect in that love. The reason that fiery trials and hardships come on us in our life is so that we can develop spiritually enough and develop enough strength of character to love sacrificially in the same way that Jesus did, not just when it's easy, not just, um, not just when things are good, not just when we are, when life is wonderful, but in the hard times. And that's why God allows the hardships to come because our existence is about spiritual growth. We are growing as spiritual beings. And, um, and this life here in these physical bodies is part of that. It's where we come to develop deeper strength of character, develop um, spiritual strength. So to put it, to learn to find God in a place where he is not easily found. To learn to love sacrificially in a place where we may have no reason to. I wanted to start with Bible passages and um, now I'm also going to give a little bit of my personal experience. So every time I share this story, it's really hard for me to talk about it because I hear myself and I realize how crazy it is. But um, there's really a point I want to make with this, so I'm just going to go for it again here. So I was born with a memory. I was born into this 
life in this world with a memory of planning this life before I was born. So because of this, I believe that we exist as spiritual beings eternally, before and after this life, and that this life um, is just one stop on our on our journey of growth. And um, it, it, we really come here for a very specific purpose, something that we plan out in detail in advance. I knew before I came here every detail of what I was going to experience. Not only did I know, but I helped plan it with the wisdom of those who are wiser than I and were helping me guide me in my decision making. I don't remember any of the details now except for the fact that I asked for red hair and this is why I even have this memory because I was a, I asked to have red hair so that because red is the color of passion and unconditional love and I wanted to remember that loving unconditionally was connected to my purpose and so I asked for red hair and because of that I've been allowed to keep this memory, just this memory that I helped. I was planning my life and I asked for red hair, but I don't remember any of the other details. So at the time I knew every single thing that was gonna happen in my life, I knew all of the challenges and hardships that were gonna come upon me and I helped pick them for very specific reasons so that I could grow spiritually to the greatest possible extent during this lifetime and so that I could make as much of an impact on others through unconditional, self-sacrificial love while I am here. And really, I think that's what all of our purpose boils down to, and that's a whole other topic. But I do remember that in that spiritual state, I was looking down at the map of my life, which was on some sort of a screen that we could play out and go in and edit and tweak. And, um, and I was looking at it, and I was just ecstatic about all the challenges that I was going to face. I remember that feeling. I was so full of joy, and I was so happy, and I was so excited about coming to this life. And I specifically was excited about the challenges that were going to help me require um, unconditional love for me because it was going to allow me to play a role in softening the hearts of others and growing spiritually myself. It was all about love. It was all about the growth of love in my heart and in the hearts of the people around me. So I have that memory. And also, around the age of 19, I also had was commonly referred to as a near-death-like experience or spiritually transformative experience. So a lot of people will have what's called a near-death experience where they actually die, they physically die, and it can be, um, and it's proven medically that they were dead in a lot of cases, and then, but their spirit continues on and they go on into the next life and they communicate with God and see Jesus and then end up being sent back to finish their life. So I just bring that up because I'm going to go into some near-death experience stories in a moment. Um, my experience, I did not die. I was depressed to the point of suicide and I was begging God for an experience and he gave me one. I was going through, like I said, a very dark time, depressed, severely depressed, suicidal, dealing with childhood trauma on a very intense level. and really stuck, not able to um, work my way through it. And then one night when I was laying in my bed, um, I'm not going to give the whole experience, I've gone into this in other videos, but um, sum it up to say what happened is that my consciousness expanded out of my body and I entered a state of connection to ultimate knowledge. I saw my life from a very expanded point of view. I was like waking up from a dream and remembering what I had known before. That the darkness of this life, while it all feels very real when we are in it, is an illusion. I'm not saying that life is an illusion. This life is very real and it's very important. But the darkness we experience here is an illusion. We are allowed to experience darkness and evil here for the contrast. So, um, so that we can grow very strong because if we were always in a place of love and perfection then we would not be able to grow. When I was in that place I saw that the light and love of God is the only reality that actually this earth is made of brilliant light we are all made of the brilliant light that comes from God and the darkness does not actually exist. When I looked down on the earth from that place I saw blinding brilliant light and it's like when you're in a shower 
and this a really hot shower and the steam is everywhere that's what it was like everything was made out of this steam like light that was just flowing and connecting with everything and the air was light the ground was light the trees were light we were made out of light and we were this light was like steam that was flowing out of one thing into another thing and filling the air and it was just so blinding that in my physical form I wouldn't have been able to look at it um, and we were all stumbling around down here like we were blind because to us we could see the darkness here even though it doesn't actually exist we come here to experience the, the illusion of darkness evil trials and hardships separation from God so that we can have the experience of discovering that the light is real even in the deepest darkness so that we can have that experience of discovering the love of God in our hearts even when surrounded by evil so that we can develop the strength to love sacrificially even when there is no reason around us in the world that we can see to do so the Bible talks about walking by faith which is an inner state not by sight what we see around us it's because what's in our heart, that connection that we have in our heart to God, that is the reality. That's what has to be developed. That's what has to be tuned into. And um, what we see around us in the world is an illusion that we choose to help us develop that inner connection. Actually, because everything, and, and this is going purely off of my experience here, but I was shown that everything was pure, um, brilliant light. And actually, it's impossible to choose anything else aside from God. Be because when people choose the opposite of God, they're choosing an illusion that doesn't actually exist. Um, they can blind their own eyes and, with their choices and, and get to the point where they can't see God even when he is right in front of them. The consequences of that can be so real for them because that's what they're creating. And that's, um, on a different note, why, why I do believe in the existence of hell, both in this life and the next. People can become so blind with their own choices that, that all they see is the illusion. But the reality is that this life is like a dream um, or an interactive video game that we set up ahead of time and then come to choose and pl to play. And I know that might be a bit much for some of you guys. Half of you are subscribed to my channel because of my Christian Universalism videos where I um, really focus on the teachings of the Bible and so if this is like freaking some of you out I'm really sorry while we're here um, we have to be fully immersed in it and we choose to come here and not remember that this is just a dream um, so that we can get as much out of this experience as possible while we're here now I want to go through and share a few um, other people's stories with you that have been so inspiring to me and really helped me to get solid answers to this question for myself as to why does a good God allow evil to happen in the world and these are all near-death experiences um, I'll just give you a little bit of background on them and then go into the quotes that I think are important for this topic okay so Pam Reynolds is one of my favorite stories Pam Reynolds died while having um, an operation on her brain and when she was dead one of the people that she saw was her grandmother who passed before her so during her conversation with her grandmother she asked her some questions one of the things that she asked her grandmother if she was is if she's sure that she ended up in the right place because when she left her body she felt of course peace and love and she felt welcomed by her grandmother she asked her grandmother I hope I'm in the right place because I have not lived a perfect life, and Lord knows I've done my share of screwing up. Her grandmother communicated to her, you were a child sent away to school. As a child, it was expected that you would spill your milk. It's the manner in which you cleaned it up that gives us cause for pride and allows you to be here. If you were a child sent away to school. That's a theme that's going to keep coming up over and over with these stories. God knows that we're going to make mistakes because this is an imperfect world and he's already provided the way for those mistakes to be corrected. So let's look at um, one of my, actually this is one of my very favorite stories, Kimberly Clark Sharp's story. So she um, collapsed to the ground when her heart stopped beating and she had a near-death experience and during her near-death experience she um, had the opportunity to ask God any questions that she wanted. It says, I got to ask questions that later I thought were pretty profound. Like, what's the meaning of life? Why are we here? 
The answers came back very simply. Why are we born? It was love. This life is school. And it wasn't like I was learning anything, it was like I was remembering. We all bang on the door to be born into this life. It is an experience we eagerly seek out for that learning. And what I don't understand is why some people suffer, but apparently that is part of the school as well. So here's this question that we've been addressing, and she's saying, I don't understand why we have to suffer here, but it is part of the learning, and it's something that we choose. We come here knowing that it's going to happen, and and we choose it gladly. We want it because it will help us to grow. So I want to share with you Howard Storm's story. I talk about him all the time on this channel. He's my favorite near-death experience story. Um, he died when he had a hole in his duodenum overseas and couldn't get a doctor to do the necessary surgery. During his experience, he had the opportunity to ask Jesus any questions that he wanted to. Here's what he learned about the purpose of life. By the way, I will link all of these interviews below for you guys. He says, this life that we're in is about spiritual formation. That's the whole point. We're here to be matured as spiritual beings. We're not physical beings dreaming about being spiritual. We're spiritual beings having a physical experience to learn compassion and love in a world with very, very finite, limited possibilities. And God will make sure that everyone has that opportunity. This is the school of learning how to love and it's all experiential learning. It's not theoretical, it's experiential. In another interview, Storm puts it this way, we are an act of God's love expressed out and we bring that love back in a new and profound way to God from this experience of life. And all this sense of separateness and sin and chaos and evil are all things that we need to work our way through to return to the completeness and perfection of that which is God. So it's interesting that he uses the words completeness and perfection because that's exactly what we saw in 1 John 2, 4. When our faith is tested, our endurance has a chance to grow. And when our endurance becomes fully developed, we will be perfect and complete. Life is school. We are here to mature spiritually. And it is about learning to love. And um, the end goal is for us to be perfect and complete. And it's interesting um, also that in Matthew 5, Jesus gives us the definition of perfection. You have heard the law that says, love your neighbor and hate your enemies. But I say, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you in this way. You will be acting as true children of your Father in heaven, for he causes his sun to shine on the evil and the good, and he sends his rain on the just and the unjust. Therefore, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. So Jesus' definition of perfection is love. It is indiscriminate compassion. It is being so strong in your love that you can love even your enemies. And that's why we're allowed to experience the trials and hardships in life because it allows us to grow to a point where we can love our enemies. All right, so I've got another experience for you here. It's Arthur Jensen's story. He died when his when he died during a car accident and experienced the afterlife. And he says, "The whole scheme of life was plain as day. Everything on earth has its purpose. It all fits into a pattern which will in the end work out for justice and good." Trouble is nature's way of teaching lessons that won't be learned otherwise. Then he goes on to say, If everyone completely understood the afterlife, they'd quit trying to keep up with the Joneses and start learning to how to live unselfishly. Here we can change ourselves quite easily and should use this life to make ourselves into the kind of people we want to be in the hereafter. This world is a miserable place for anyone who hasn't learned internal harmony characterized by unselfish love. So we see the same things coming up over and over again. Internal harmony, that inner satisfaction of being perfect and complete in love. And he is hinting here that we come here because we can change, our, we can change ourselves easily or we can grow easily here. I have one more story for you and it's Betty Edie's story. Um, she died when she had a hemorrhage in the hospital after an operation and she also had a very profound experience had a lot of had a chance to learn a lot of things and ask a lot of questions um, she says that we all desired to come to this life that we had actually chosen many of our weaknesses and difficult situations in our lives so that we could grow and that the purpose of coming here she says we were going to take with us the love that we had 
that we had already developed that was within us and we were going to express it. We were going to use that love to create with it. We were going to explore it. And he, meaning God, knew that we would make mistakes. We would all return back to him. And then she goes on to say that the purpose for our coming to earth would be to provide situations and relationships that would allow us to learn to love. All who would be led into our paths would lead us to our ultimate achievement. We were to be tested under challenging conditions to see how we would live the most important commandment of all, to love one another. Um, again, it, it all is coming back to love. It's all coming back to spiritual growth. It, it's just crazy how much this just repeats the biblical passages that we looked at at the beginning. Our lives, including and especially our hardships, are intricately planned out and chosen ahead of time. We come here to accomplish specific goals and it all relates back to um, spiritual growth into love. We are pressed here on our ability to live the greatest commandment, to love God, which is to find that inner connection with God in our hearts and to love each other in an environment where our ability to sense God and our ability to love others will be sorely tested. When I had my near-death-like experience, one of the things that I saw very clearly was um, God's plan for the universe and I do not remember anything of what that plan was because it was too expansive to understand here but it was also ridiculously simple I do remember a visual I remember looking down on it from above and it was like a giant Mandela pattern colorful and music and um, swirling around sort of like looking down on the top of a hurricane and um, but so much more intricate detail going on inside the hurricane. The outer edges were swirling around and they were pulling everything back in to the center. But between the outer edges and the center, we had the life paths of all created conscious beings. And within these life paths, every created conscious being had free choice. All of this was going on within the hurricane while the outer current of the edges was pulling everything back into the center. And that's um, a lousy description, but it's the best that I can do. Even with all the wrong choices that we choose to make and the resulting evil and trials and hardships and darkness that seems to be created here, it was indescribably beautiful. Everybody's life path, it was so beautiful. And I can't explain that now, but it was almost like um, the, the current of love that was pulling everything back in just erased evil before it could even happen. Even though it's so real to us here that the, the power of God is so far beyond it that it was weaving it into something good and beautiful. It couldn't have turned out or ended up any other way. It had to be like this and it was absolute perfection. No matter how dark our choices may be in no matter how horrific what horrific things people may create in this world it's no match for that outer current that is bringing everything back into alignment with love oh, somehow we all have free will within the plan but inevitably our free choice will lead us back to God because it's that pressure of growth that refines us it's that pressure of going through the hardships that perfects us into a a state of complete love and I know some people would say this isn't actually free will but this is the truth of what I saw so it's like science shows us that cold doesn't actually exist cold is just um, the lack of heat or that darkness doesn't actually exist it's not actually a thing it's just the absence of light so the other day my youngest son asked me he's four it's unbelievable how deeply they can think about things that this age but he asked me how can God be good and loving and allow hatred to exist in the world and I said hatred is what happens when love is not there so I took a cup and I filled it up with water and I said this cup is somebody's heart and the water is God's love and I said do you understand this what's in this cup and he said love and so I dumped the love out and I said now what's in this cup hatred Hatred is emptiness. It's nothingness. It's just what happens when the love is gone, or maybe more accurately, when the love is unseen. Because the love 
is always there. The goodness is always there. The entire world is made of brilliant light, but when we cannot see that, the illusion of the lack of that love, of the emptiness of that love, is what we perceive as hatred, darkness, and evil. To answer the question, how could a good God, a all-powerful, all-good, and all-loving God allow evil to exist in the world? Well, first of all, he doesn't. It's all an illusion, and it's something that we come to experience because we need to grow. Why do we need to grow? Why do we need to have this experience? Why why aren't we just all perfect to begin with? That, I don't know. That's getting a little deep um, for the answers that I have and the understanding that I have right now. What I do know is that it's all about growth, and it is all about learning to love, and it is all about um, finding that inner satisfaction of love of God in your heart and it has become perf- becoming perfect and complete in that love to the point where you can love your enemies and you can love in the darkest of situations because what you carry in your heart is so strong. God allows the illusion of evil in our lives to bring us to that place. Darkness exists in the world as a result of our individual and collective choices to be empty of love, to have our eyes blinded to love and to choose the illusion. But at the same time, they are used for good, to remind us of what we are lacking and drive us to find and grow strong in that love connection in our hearts even in the darkest of places, because it is in the darkest of places that we see how bright the light actually shines. And a lot of times, at least for me, I find the darkest things I've gone through in my life, I wouldn't want to go through them again, but I am so glad I did because I would have no, I wouldn't have discovered the depth of the love of God. I wouldn't have had my eyes blinded to that light if I hadn't found it in the darkest of places. So when your eyes are open to love, the darkness disappears, and when all of our eyes are collectively open, and the love of Christ reigns in every heart, there will be no more illusion, there will be no more need for it, and we will be living in paradise here and or wherever we may be. That's all I got for you today. Hopefully that didn't get a little um, too crazy and weird for some of you, um, but Don't forget to comment and let me know what you think. Be loved, be happy, be at peace, and thank you for watching.